Welcome back to the channel and uh, we have the Amiga 4000 on the bench. You may have watched my previous series on this uh, machine. Um, it was originally bought non-functioning from uh, a guy in Worcester in the UK. It was originally used on, an, uh, on a TV station as far as I'm aware and uh, if you have a look at that series, I'll show you the link there, you'll see how I got this machine back from being broken with quite a lot of battery damage uh, to being functioning again. Now then, why are we here today? Well, in another series, which I'll show you the link to here, we've looked at uh, making blue SCSI and in particular we actually got a, an external and an internal, well actually no, it was an external blue SCSI working in my Amiga 500 and that was to explore using a feature of a blue SCSI V2 which is Dynaport, which is a Wi-Fi solution well, actually, it was an Ethernet solution originally for the Macintosh, which Eric, uh, the creator of the Blue SCSI V2, has managed to finagle into that product as well. And that allows you to use Wi-Fi um, on your Amiga basically for free, as long as you have a Blue SCSI uh, hard drive replacement in the machine. Uh, here's actually a Blue SCSI V2 here, and we'll talk about this in a few seconds, what we're planning to do with it here. So yeah, this, this is actually something uh, of a saga. Um, now originally this machine had, um, well, when I say originally, uh, after renovation, uh, the solution I had in this machine for a hard drive was this uh, device here from Amiga Kit, um, which unfortunately after this video will be uh, surplus to needs, but it's uh, a compact flash to IDE adapter. Hopefully you can see that. And uh, it allows you to mount it on the back bracket of the um, expansion slots on the Amiga 4000. And that allows you then obviously to put a compact flash in and boot the machine uh, using its built-in IDE controller. But I was interested in, in getting SCSI working in this machine. And the reason for that is that there's a little bit of history with this actually. Um, back in the day, um, generally the solution for hard drives on the Amiga from the Amiga 2000 onwards was SCSI and you'd have an, uh, an expansion card in the Amiga 2000 uh, connected to a SCSI hard drive. Um, this is actually uh, an original SCSI hard drive. It's a Quantum Pro Drive LPS, uh, which I actually got with my Amiga 2000. That came with a Trump Card Professional SCSI card, and this is the drive which came with that machine. When I received that machine, this drive was making slightly funny noises, so I decided to try and um, copy the data off it. Unfortunately, that failed, and in the end, uh, this drive uh, turned out to be uh, on its last legs, and I think it has now died. Uh, I like to keep it around as an example of what an actual physical hard drive looks like, because this has actually got um, almost like a stereotypical design to it. Uh, these sectors on the top, um, really love that design. It's very techno, you know, that kind of appearance to it. Love it. Anyway, it doesn't work anymore. So I wanted to get a SCSI hard drive working in this machine and this machine came along at a time when uh, the industry was transitioning from SCSI 1 to SCSI 2 hard drives. What does that mean? Well, the ID drives, the ID bus which is in this machine, which I think is a PIO0 generation, um, gives you, I think it's about two and a half megabytes a second of data transfer. And I did some research into what was possible on the Amiga 4000 because it's a 32-bit machine it had the possibility of using SCSI 2. There were some SCSI solutions that came out. I think there was the, is it the A4091 from Commodore? And that actually came out after the machine was released. It's a SCSI 2 solution. It was produced because there were grumblings from a lot of Amiga users who bought the A4000 that they actually wanted to use SCSI. And the reason for that is, we won't get into that too much here, but SCSI can have multiple devices. ID can only do two per bus, and SCSI is more flexible. You can have different types of devices, CD-ROMs, scanners, uh, even networking, as we found out. And um, unfortunately, you can't get those anymore. Um, but there was also the fast lane uh, Z3, and, and actually this is the card that we've got here. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have a quick look at this. Um, as you can see, I have it. Um, this has actually got a little bit of history behind how I actually got hold of this. So. Uh, Let's change cameras and have a quick look at this up close and see what we actually have. So this is the Faith, I think it's Phase 5 is the name of the company, and it's the Fastlane. 
And you can see on the back here, if we try and keep this in focus, that there's the actual legend there, the Fast Lane Z3. Uh, this is a revision 2.2. Uh, not one of the later boards. There was a 2.3 and I think a 2.4, which came a little bit later. So yeah, there's the back of the board, uh, the Fastlane Z3. There's the larger legend there. So it's a Zorro 3 card, and that means it's got um, a bigger bus, and it can actually transfer more data, which means it can actually do SCSI 2 speeds. So what does it actually provide? Well, it's a dual purpose card, and you can probably see, you know, that's pretty obvious really, but just by looking at it. On the left-hand side, we have a large number of memory slots. Um, there are 16 altogether. And that means that this card can support up to 64 megabytes of RAM, which for the time was a massive amount of RAM. And there's a mod that can be done to this uh, card. And that means that it can actually then um, take 16 megabyte SIMs, which apparently were very rare. Um, I'm not going to try and get those because if they were rare back then, can you imagine how rare they are now? But that would allow this uh, card to then support 256 megabytes of RAM. That's pretty amazing. That's right up there with the Quadra uh, machines from Macintosh in terms of RAM, and that would have made this into a really powerful workstation back in the day. So this side of the card, like I said, is, is all uh, RAM related. There are some jumpers down here, um, which are to do with actually configuring how much memory you have. The, these jumpers here, uh, right in the center there, they actually define whether the memory is working at all. You have to basically take this off. Uh, the right-hand side jumper, otherwise you're not going to get any extra RAM whatsoever. And then over here, got another bunch of uh, jumpers which are all RAM related. On the left, you've got three jumpers which allow you to set the speed of the memory. I think the left jumper is 40 nanoseconds, which wasn't actually supported officially. Um, and then I think it does um, 60 and 80. And then on the right-hand side, you've got these jumpers which then uh, are used in, in conjunction with these jumpers here to actually configure how much RAM you have. You're meant to put RAM in in uh, blocks of four, um, and that then gives you the full 32 bits of memory. Um, so yeah, you have to basically populate uh, four SIMs at a time. I currently have four sets of four in here, so this would give you an extra 16 megabytes of RAM. But there is a problem with the memory on this card, and that's something that we're going to discuss a bit later. That's one of the reasons for doing this video, actually, is to, if anybody out there does actually have a Z3, it's a really fantastic card, but there are some really massive gotchas with it. And um, I really wanted to document those because believe me, they got me a few times. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that other people didn't have to go through the, the pain that I've had to go through to get this working. On the right-hand side, I believe all of this area is to do with the SCSI side of it. Uh, there's the actual 50-pin SCSI connector there. Uh, there are some jumpers up here which allow you to configure how the uh, SCSI is going to work whether it's going to use synchronous or asynchronous mode, so on and so forth. Um, these very often were also available in software, uh, but on here they're actually available via jumpers. A previous owner, and that's an important thing to remember in this video, has modified this board. And you can see that they put um, heat sinks on. They've gone cheap, unfortunately, they've gone for aluminium. But um, anyway, they have put heat sinks on. And funnily enough, actually, originally, when I got this, all of these chips here had heat sinks on, which is very odd because if you actually put these heat sinks, which you can see here, on these chips, you can't actually put the memory uh, sticks in, uh, <laughs> which is kind of bizarre. So um, this was sold to me as not gnome working. Bit of a gamble. Uh, it's quite expensive, actually, but it did come with a whole bunch of RAM. Here's the rest of the RAM here. Um, and this is a, well, actually, in this bag, there's actually another, uh, these are all one megabyte SIMs. Um, but I do have another set of RAM, which is another uh, four 16 uh, sticks. I don't really think I'm desperate to get too much RAM in it, but 32 would have been nice. But yeah, there were issues with that, which we'll talk about. So there we are. That's the card. Um, is there anything else I'd like to talk about? Well, actually, the back of it has a slightly more old-fashioned connector. Um, it's not using um, the sort of smaller 50-pin uh, SCSI 2 connector. It's using this larger one. But um, if you'll know SCSI, you know that you can get adapters for it and you can actually uh, get around that. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see this card cloned. I'd like there to be a new version of it. The A409, as far as I'm aware, has a re-Amiga version. So it's a brand new version of that card produced by Dave Haney and uh, one other guy, I think. And that might still be available. Depends when you watch this video. And that's actually a modern recreation of the A4091. And I'll link to that. There's actually an interesting video uh, that I'll point you to talking about. In fact, there's a couple. So I'll, I'll try and um, 
link to those in sequence so you can see those. Yeah, so it'd be great if somebody could actually get one of these, break it down, um, take all these gals or pals here, I can't tell what they are to be honest because of the heat sinks, um, take those off, uh, image them, get the code, combine it all together, put it into some kind of FPGA or one of those other kind of uh, modern equivalents. Um, and it'd be great if you know we could have a modern version of this as well because this is actually a pretty cool card as well. So anyway, let's put it in the machine. Okay, so let's take the fast lane card and get it in there. Um, it's a little bit of an awkward beast uh, to get in. Um, I'll actually point something out to you before I do that is that the, um, the mounting bracket for this is actually missing. Um, there's a screw missing here. Uh, let's see if I can get that on camera. There we are. Um, there's actually a screw missing there. I don't know if you can see that. Um, the screw on the other side is actually there. There it is. And that's actually meant to attach this to a back uh, plate for the expansion slot. But yeah, somehow in the, in the midst of time, that's gone out the window. Um, so to get it in the slot, you have to get the, uh, the port at the back, the external port through the uh, back, and then you have to slide the right-hand side. And it's actually, if I'll show you, it's actually got like a notch taken out of it because it, obviously they've discovered during the development process that if this was actually uh, here, if it was a square end to the board, it wouldn't actually fit into the machine. So they've adapted the uh, PCB design to actually allow you to fit it in, which is quite funny. Um, so yeah, let's pop it through the uh, hole there, um, the expansion port at the back, into the card holder, and then we'll just slide it in. That's actually covered in the manual, which is actually pretty good, the manual. I'm quite impressed with it. Um, it does cover a lot. And then once you've got it in position, um, a lot of people will find this with the Amiga 4000, 3000, I suppose as well, is that getting cards in is actually quite difficult. And the best technique that I found is to push from the back, holding onto the case. And I find that rocking uh, the card can help a bit. So let's try doing that and wriggling it. So sort of like rocking, there we are. It's actually popped in. And then you just need to make sure it is pushed on properly. There we go. That's it. So that's the first part of the process about getting the card installed. And um, the next thing obviously is to plug in your, uh, your SCSI device. Now there's a blue SCSI V2 here, I've already made. Um, I've already got this image here, which is now working. Um, and yeah, it was quite a palaver to actually get this device working. Um, that's actually the main reason why I'm making this video, to, honestly, is to document it for other people um, and to avoid people you know, falling into the same pitfalls that I did. The connector on it, luckily on the SCSI is actually keyed there. I don't know if you can see that little notch, which means you can't put the cable in backwards. And the same thing with the connector here. So I'm just gonna plug this in. So I got the, um, the cable, uh, it's a 30 centimeter long SCSI cable. I got it from Amiga kit. Uh, we're luckily in, the, in Cardiff in the UK here. And it's, it's only 30 centimeters long. And for some reason I thought that would be good enough. But in fact, it has to go from here all the way through the slot here, which is actually in the riser card, which allows you to put um, cables through the machine into this area. And this is actually the drive bay. This is actually where it's gonna go. And um, right now you can see lurking in here, I've actually got a, um, an SD2 IDE card. And this was actually used during the um, setup of this when I was having trouble with the, um, the SCSI card. So this is my fallback. Um, now, obviously I've got to be careful not to put that like this because that would actually short. Um, and that's why I was using bags and things like that to actually uh, make sure that didn't happen during the process. So the other thing that this needs as well is it needs a power supply. So I've actually got that currently plugged in here. You can see I've got that large Molex to floppy drive connector uh, plugged in there. Um, that would actually normally go into here. Um, and once that's in, that will then get enough power and uh, it should then function correctly. If you watch the other video, you will see that an important part of working with the Blue SCSI, I think, when you're getting it set up is to use the serial connection. So please also watch that video because we, we go into that in some detail how you get that set up. It's pretty simple. But if you do that, you will find that you will actually be able to see uh, what's actually happening on the uh, SCSI bus. And that is ob absolutely invaluable when you're working uh, with this device because you're working with old hardware, it may not necessarily work correctly and it's very, very diagnostic. You turn on the machine, you actually see commands being issued on the SCSI bus and that's a sign that it's working, right? If you don't see that, you know that you've got a deeper problem. So definitely 
uh, watch that video if you can and uh, see how I actually dealt with that. What were the problems with this card? So I've got this plugged in, it should work. I actually took the images off this, off my Amiga 500 to start off with. Um, I then had to do an installation of an older version of the OS because I didn't have the ROMs uh, which matched that machine. Um, but I actually got that working on WinUAE using the emulator. Again, if you watch that video, I go into that in quite some detail, how to do that. At the end of the day, what I got myself was a machine that should boot up. Uh, I put that SD card in here with the right images, and then it's just a case of actually getting it to work. I originally booted up using um, the uh, SD to IDE card. And um, once I did that, I then used uh, the utilities that came with the Z3 card. And they basically allow you to uh, set the options on the card, whether it's going to use synchronous uh, connections and so on and so forth. And then the other um, utility allows you to configure the, the hard drives and then format them, you know, partition them. And then hopefully then you go into Workbench and then you format the drives. But the problem is that wasn't working. There are some very particular things about this card. So what we're going to do next is we're going to look at the manual and read up some of the things that it says in there to see why you know, we were having some of these issues. So if you do a search online, you'll actually find this manual. This is the manual for the Fastlane Z3 from Phase 5. And as you can see, it says it's a fast SCSI 2 DMA capable controller for the Amiga Zorro 3 expansion bus, which is primarily the Amiga 4000. The Amiga 3000 does also have the Zorro 3 expansion bus. It's an earlier version, it's a little bit more buggy. And as we know, this card was made specifically for the Amiga 4000 and that's its, its main market. But obviously it works on the 3000 as well, I believe. So yeah, this is the cover and I read through this, there are many sections on how to install the memory, the different banks that the memory has to go into, the different jumpers that have to be set to get the memory working. However, in this video, we're not going to look at the memory because there are issues with it on this card. And it does actually play into some of the issues that I was having getting this card to work as well. So we'll discuss that a little bit later. So let's have a look at what it actually says about the card. Well, the first thing it says is, before you install the card, you actually probably need to take out your CPU board. And it says here, it says that on Amiga 4000 models with a, with a revision 3.068040 CPU board, the clock driver chip is located underneath the board and it needs to be replaced with a different chip. As it says there, this, I think it's the, the 74FCT244 needs to be replaced with the 74FCT240. And it says it's because there's a signal inversion and you have to double invert it to get it back to being normal, basically. That was the first thing that worried me when I got this card. Now, luckily the vendor that sold it to me said RTFM. We all know what RTFM means, right? And so I did. I thought, okay, he's telling me something here. He said he hadn't used the card for five years, so he, so he couldn't remember anything specific, but he did remember that there were some very specific bits of information in the manual that I should be aware of. So be warned, if you do get one of these cards, read the manual. So if we have a look at the next page, you'll see that it says, if you have a revision 3.1, uh, CPU board, then you do not have to make this chip replacement. So if we have a look at a scan here that I have of my Amiga 4000, so you can see here, if we look at my particular board, it's actually a revision 3.1. So that meant I didn't need to make the modification that you see here. I didn't actually have to take up my CPU card and pull out that chip and put in the other chip, which I don't have. Uh, the vendor that sold this to me didn't actually supply that chip. so. I would obviously have to try and source that chip. I'm assuming because it's a 74 that it would be an off the shelf uh, chip. So I'm, I'm assuming it wouldn't be that difficult to do. But anyway, didn't have to do that. It then goes on to say, and this is actually very important. It says installing the new Super Bust and Custom chip. At the time of completion of this user manual in June, 1993, Commodore was beginning to supply a new version of the Buster chip. This is version 11. And this replaces the previous version nine which was fitted to the Amiga 4000 when it was actually launched. The Fastlane Z3 though is equipped with special, as it says, expensive circuitry, which is the reason why I bought this card, which means that it doesn't actually have to have a Super Buster 11 because the card itself has special code on it, obviously in the GALs or PALs or whatever they are, that actually work around the limitations of the Super Buster 9 and get you the same kind of performance 
but using the special circuitry on the card itself. As we saw when we looked at this card, there is a lot of extra logic on it. So I have to assume that that's obviously successful. It does the job. Um, and it says here that goes on to talk about the Buster 11, but we won't really worry about that for now. We know that we can use my existing Super Buster 9 with this card. Okay. So then I went on to read about bus termination, SCSI IDs, and things like that. Once I, I was you know, pretty happy with that, you can see here it's showing the terminator resistors in white here. Uh, mine are actually uh, blue and yellow, I think. Um, I don't know if that's because they've been replaced or whatever, but uh, they're right next to the 50 pin socket on the board, which I'll highlight for you. I took those out actually and tested those with the multimedia to make sure that they were had the right kind of resistance, or at least consistent resistance, because I didn't really know exactly what the resistance level should be. But I measured them all, and they all were consistent with each other. So I had to assume that I didn't have three bad resistor packs, so I had to assume that resistance was working correctly. Plug those back in, off we go. As I said, I had the images set up to actually work on this Amiga 4000 with the right version of Workbench. So I plugged it in, and I found that I had major issues. So I don't have any recorded footage of this, but I'll describe it to you. If I used um, HD Toolbox, I went into HD Toolbox and I changed it to use the Z3 SCSI driver. That's specific to this card. Um, that gets loaded from the ROM on the actual card itself. Um, and we'll come back to the ROM later as well. Once you've done that, you can actually see the images that the blue SCSI presents to the operating system, effectively, you know, the emulated hard drives. And I could see those, and I went through each one of those, and then uh, I configured them um, to make sure that you know they were going to work uh, correctly. And once I did that, I then quit out of HT Toolbox to go and format them. And this is where things got weird, because normally what would happen is once you've actually configured a hard drive and saved those uh, values, partitioned the drive, got it ready basically to be formatted, you would see those hard drives appear on your workbench as uh, unformatted hard disks but I didn't. Uh, they didn't appear there. So that was very weird. I thought, mm, that's quite strange. I've obviously done something wrong. Went back and did it again. It, yeah, it just didn't work. So then I rebooted the machine and uh, one of the hard drives actually did turn up. So I thought, ah, okay, it requires a reboot. So I got the hard drive, the unformatted hard drive, formatted it, give it a name, uh, did a quick format, waited for it to finish. And when it was finished, it was there on the desktop with the name that I gave it. So as a test, what I did was I copied some games from my Compact Flash card that I showed you earlier that we were booting from. I copied those uh, games onto uh, the newly formatted uh, SCSI hard disk and it errored. It was coming up with checksum errors. So I thought, oh God, this doesn't look good. You know, this card has been sold to me as um, not necessarily working. The, the previous owner couldn't actually test it because he'd sold his machine or so he told me. So I thought, okay, this is looking really problematic. It could be a dud. But what I found weird was, was that the card was basically working. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that um, if I went into HD Toolbox, it didn't show me any hard drives. It did. So that's weird. Um, and I previously tested this blue SCSI V2 in my GVP sidecar in, in my Amiga 500. So I knew that was working okay. So I didn't think there was a problem with that, that card. So I thought, well, this is a bit strange, isn't it? So the next thing I did was I then went onto the internet, went onto AmiNet, and I found the actual uh, driver disks and the utility disks for the Fastlane Z3, downloaded those, transferred those onto the machine using WinUAE, booted back up again, and then uh, used those utilities as well. What I found was they seemed to be working as, as, as well, you know. Um, however, when I was using the SCSI partitioning software, I found that it was giving me checksum errors again. Generally, it would recognize the drives. It would iterate through the drives. Let's say there were three, it would say, you know, there are three drives, but it would error on each one saying there was a checksum error. So this was very, very strange. Now, don't forget, this card doesn't need to have a Buster Revision 9 because it's got the special circuitry on board, so it doesn't need that. So that can't be the problem. So to simplify things, at this point, I actually had uh, the memory working, but I decided to disable that. So I disabled the memory. Uh, I went back to having 60 megabytes of RAM, which is perfectly fine. Same thing, wasn't working, check some errors. So I thought that was very, very strange. I went on to various forums and I asked the community's help, always a good thing because number one, they are experts uh, very often, or at least they can give you uh, useful pointers. And one of the questions that somebody asked me was, does this have the latest ROM on it? 
So if we think back to the card and the back of the card, it says it's a 2.2 version of this card. And I checked online to see when the latest version of the ROM, which is 8.5, actually came to market. And it turns out that it was actually released, I think, with version 2.3 or 2.4. Not quite sure about that. But it definitely wasn't on the 2.2. So I went into Workbench, used the command line, asked the version of the Z3 device driver, and it said there was 8.5. So that was weird. This is an older card, but it has the latest ROM on it. So I thought, OK, well, that's interesting. Didn't particularly inform me. I, I mean, I've read online that uh, you need the latest 8.5 RAM for this card to work with the 68060. I don't have a 68060, so I didn't really worry about that. I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe the person that I bought it from had a 68060 uh, accelerator in his Amiga 4000. That's why he updated his ROM. So a few days passed. I kept on hammering away at the hard drive, trying different things, asking people about different settings, and nothing really seemed to be fixing the problem. And then eventually I had a bit of an epiphany because I'd read the manual from top to bottom and there's a lot of information in there. So it's quite easy to miss something. But I remember this piece of information here. So let's go back and have a look at the page that we had a look at a little bit earlier. So this is the page talking about the Super Buster, okay? And it says, if the Buster chip is updated to the new version, version 11, then dependent on the speed of the hard disk, a varying increase in the free CPU time of approximately between 20 to 40% is apparent with DMA operations on the fast lane. Okay, that's interesting. Not particularly relevant to me because I didn't upgrade to the 11, okay? And then I went on to read, dependent on the version of the fast lane hardware, it may be necessary to exchange a program chip on the fast lane to achieve this increased free CPU time. Consult the readme file on the diskette supplied with the Fastlane Z3 to establish whether this needs to be carried out. Well, I couldn't find that file, but I thought to myself, the previous owner updated the ROM. That meant they weren't happy with the previous ROM. They wanted to use it with a newer version of something. Maybe it was a uh, 68060, or I'm not quite sure. But it says here that if you actually have a, a Buster version 11, then you can actually get a speed increase. So I thought to myself, maybe you have to have the 8.5 ROM in conjunction with the 11 Super Buster to get that increase in CPU time back. All it's gonna do basically is mean that your CPU is used less. And I assume that's because the Buster 11 actually does the DMA transfer rather than it relying on the card and some extra CPU usage that's involved in doing that. It's using basically the native hardware in the Buster 11 to do that rather than lying on you know, the CPU. And there's the, there's the telling thing. It says the hardware may need to be modified to get that to work. Now, I don't know what the hardware change is, but this was my logic. If the previous user had made that change, may not have even been them actually, it, made, it could have been the person that originally owned this card, you know, back in the 90s or something like that, then, then that would mean that this card was inherently locked to actually needing a Super Buster 11. Does that make sense? It's not now independent of a Super Buster 11. It has to have one because now it's been updated to take advantage of the hardware features of that Super Buster 11. And if those features are not there, you may find that the DMA operation of this card has issues. And what was I getting? Checksum errors, which suggests that data was being transferred from the disk to memory. The checksum was not matching between what was in memory and what was on the hard disk. So there was something going on during the transfer that was causing corruption in the data. So I took a bet that if I got the Super Buster 11, which I needed anyway for future enhancements to this machine, there was a chance that it might actually fix the problem. So I scooted off to Analogic in Kingston, which is actually quite near to me. They're a big reseller of those chips, and we popped that chip into the machine. So let me just show you where that actually goes on the Logic board. Okay, so this is the part of the Amiga 4000 where the battery damage happened. As I said, if you watch the previous series, you'll see this is where the battery was, and it um, caused some carnage in this area, and I had to replace this chip. Um, but anyway, the outcome of that series was it was uh, very successful. The machine now works. It's got two megabytes of chip RAM and it's got the full 16 megabytes of uh, fast RAM as well. Now, when I got this machine, uh, originally it had a Buster 9 in it. You know, we've discussed already that the, uh, the fast lane card doesn't need to have that replaced. But 
as we found out, there were issues with it. So it did need to have it replaced. So this is actually my original Buster 9. The more astute amongst you may realize it's actually not in its socket. It's just sitting jauntily on top of it at the moment. So luckily I live within close driving distance of Analogic. And uh, I've had a chat with the owner on a couple of occasions. And he's an interesting chap because he was actually one of the main dealers in the UK back in the 1990s when uh, the Amiga was in full swing. And when the Amiga went down the tubes, he was given the fantastic opportunity to buy a lot of the stock uh, when the company went bankrupt. So he actually did uh, buy a lot of Amigas back in the day. I think Amiga 4000 in particular, he bought a lot of. And as a result of that, he has a large stock of complete Amiga 4000s, uh, their logic boards and the individual chips. And he is uh, a main reseller now. Now, some people get annoyed by his prices and I must admit some of them are uh, a little bit on the toasty side. But I guess that's just market forces, I suppose. To be fair, anybody else uh, selling chips as well these days, they would charge quite a lot of money as well. Um, so underneath here is a Super Buster 11. So I've actually got the packet for that here. Um, and I'm going to keep the, the 9 in here and tape it up, keep it safe. So there we are. We've got uh, the Super Buster in position here, uh, the Super Buster 11. And that will actually sort out the problems, hopefully, with the, the Fastlane card. So yeah, that's where it goes. Hopefully it's worth the money that I paid for it, because yeah, it wasn't cheap. Okay, so there we go. We've uh, taken out the Buster 9. It's actually in this packet here for safekeeping. Keep the stack static electricity off it. I've set up the Amiga 4000. I've got the power supply coming here into the blue SCSI. And we've got the uh, SCSI cable plugged in. So uh, let's see what happens. Now, when we do this, I'm going to switch views to look at the screen. And unfortunately, my monitor uh, seems to be on its last legs. Uh, so it's very dim. Um, so uh, we're actually going to change the lighting as well so we can see it a bit better on the footage. I would like to get a, a video capture system um, so we can get direct output. Um, but right now, the budget isn't there. So uh, bear with me while we do it this way. So yeah, let's change the lighting and turn on the machine and see what happens. Okay, so let's turn on the machine and see what the Super Buster 11 has done, if anything. So one thing I would say is that if you have a number of SCSI devices attached, it does take a while to boot. So one thing I might do to optimize this machine in the future is actually to reduce the number of SCSI devices have actually got attached. Here we go. It's not too bad, actually. So what do we have? Well, right now I've got, uh, I think it's four SCSI devices, actually. Um, and I do need to do some work on this. It's a bit messy at the moment. It's actually all a bit new. Yeah. So we have uh, work, which is my workbench disk. There is another partition on that logical device, which is apps here. Uh, then we have SCSI device 1, which is games A, uh, 2, which is games B, and 3, which is store. So let me show you uh, the utilities that we were talking about earlier, which are actually on apps. SCSI tools, there we are. So this is unit control, and this is actually used for configuring the drives on the Z3. This is actually a utility from phase 5, and because they produce more devices over time, this was actually then used for those devices. So if you actually get this, you can set it up to work with other devices by modifying the uh, SCSI device that actually works with there, you see? Because um, I think they did the Cyberstorm uh, device as well. So yeah, that's for configuring your devices. So let's just start that up. So for example, if I click on um, device zero, which is the boot drive, and I go to options, you'll see that it's currently using synchronous mode and synchronous mode needs a speed, which is set up to be 10 megabytes a second. And it's using eight byte handshake. Um, the manual goes into some detail about this and it says basically that the bigger the handshake, the bigger the potential for performance. But actually depending on the machine that can actually reduce the performance. So um, I need to do some benchmarking on this machine and try and work out is this the optimal value? Right now, this is the default synchronous mode. And you also have asynchronous mode, which is uh, the default on the older drives. Synchronous mode is faster. 
but when you start up this machine by default, it will actually be in asynchronous mode. So we have to use this utility to actually do that. And I'll show that to you in a minute. Yeah, anyway, once you get all this stuff, you can actually do this uh, individually with, with each drive and tweak it and then save the values for each one of these. Um, and if you have a look, actually, you'll see that um, there's a different value for each. You see, I've got this one set to um, 10 bytes. I think this one might be 12. Yeah, 12. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing that is so that when I benchmark them, I can kind of see if there's any difference in performance. So that's unit control. Then you've got SCSI config. And this is the utility that you saw earlier in a photograph. And uh, this was the utility that was actually erroring whenever I ran it. And if I then did partitioning and saved it out, it would also throw checksum errors. Um, and that was all a symptom of the fact that we were using the Buster 9 and it needed to be changed to the Buster 11. So thank God I had that epiphany and realized that you know that change had to be made. So yeah, SCSI config. Uh, there is also from an older version of the card, this thing called ZDMA control. Uh, however, um, phase five did actually remove that from the later disks. Um, and that the, these utilities here are actually from the later disks. Um, so I might try that out, but I've got a feeling it isn't really that compatible with the, the drivers these days. So um, it's more of a sort of uh, legacy thing. I'm just gonna sort of experiment more with unit control two. I actually find it to be pretty zippy. How zippy is it? Well, I've got some benchmarks here. And if we open up uh, SysSpeed, it has a, a drive benchmark. Um, I must admit, I did try using SysInfo, but I found that SysInfo seems to be very synthetic. Like every single drive is the same speed. It's like, it tells you instantly how fast it is. And apparently it's just telling you the theoretical speed of the bus, not the actual performance of the drive. So I needed like a real world uh, benchmark. I do have this uh, disk speed as well, but I found that actually seems to take forever to do its benchmarking. So for this video, we'll just use uh, SysSpeed because it's actually relatively quick. So let's just load that back up again. And in preferences, I've got it set to use it UDH4, which actually, funnily enough, because of the shenanigans of getting this machine set up, that actually is the zero drive, uh, the boot drive. So I've got that set to, to do the uh, benchmarking. So if we go back here, and uh, we click on uh, low, I guess these are low level uh, benchmarks and we click on drive, it will do a benchmark for that drive. There it goes. And because uh, it's actually using the first partition for this benchmark, it's actually pretty quick. I actually use the same benchmark on the other drives and they are larger, they have larger partitions, about four gigabytes. Uh, they actually do take quite a while to run. And I found that sometimes when you run it, it doesn't necessarily give the same results each time. So you can see here, it's saying that the drive's results in megabytes are create, creating a file was four megabytes a second, writing a file was 3.8, uh, reading was 6.12, and the raw read was 8.9 megabytes a second. Uh, if we do the drive test again, I've actually seen it top out for the raw reads. I'm not, not sure if that's actually equivalent to the you know the real raw performance but um, yeah on occasions I've seen it top out at uh, 10.5 megabytes a second and even 13 megabytes a second which seems a bit crazy because I don't think the drive is capable of doing that so it's possible that it's actually the read file which is the one we should be looking at I'm not quite sure about that uh, people out in the Amiga community might want to comment on this and tell us you know what they think about these benchmark results and what I should be looking at I have to say in terms of real world usage, it does feel very nippy. Everything opens very fast and you know files do seem to load pretty quickly. So that's the benchmark. Um, and let's go back to um, the SCSI tools. Uh, to get this so that it gets executed on launch, we have to use the startup sequence uh, scripts. Uh, so what I've done is I've actually copied unit control two into my C directory. So it's uh, available from the shell. Um, and I'll show you that now. If we click on shell and we do um, version uh, C and then it's a unit control. You can see it's telling us that it's version 2.7, phase five, blah, blah, blah. So there we are, it's available for us to use. When I copied it into the C drive, I actually removed the two from its end. I just wanted it to be called unit control. So it's not versioned. That's just in case I wanted to replace it with something else, which I don't think I will. This is the latest version of it, so uh, there shouldn't be any need now to replace that with something else. So if we go into the work 
uh, folder. This is my workbench folder, and we show all files. We can now see the S directory, which is the startup directory. And if we go in here, we need to find the user startup script. So this is obviously um, where your custom uh, startup stuff happens, non sort of OSE. And you can see there's already uh, a few entries here. These are what I added earlier. And it's using the same pattern as what I actually saw for Roadshow. So um, it's saying that if C unit control exists, then do this. And it's saying C unit control, unit zero, in other words, drive zero, the boot drive, period 10. This actually is the uh, megabytes per second uh, setting that, that we just saw when it's in synchronous mode. And then also you need to set the bytes handshake. And in this case, it's called offset. Uh, so you can see I set that to eight bytes. Uh, this one I set as 10, this one is 12, and this one is 16. And you can see they're all set to 10 megabytes a second. I've had people uh, report that sometimes if you set it to 10, you actually get a worse performance than if you set it to six or a lower value. So this is something I might have to come back to and tweak, make sure that that benchmark's actually showing what I think it is, which is it, it appears to be showing 10 megabytes a second, but it, it may not be, um, we'll have to see. So that then gets executed at boot, and it's setting uh, drive zero, one, two, and three to use these values. So you should get the optimal performance out of this hard drive as long as these are configured correctly. And that's it really, the drive is working. As you can see, it's booting from it. Yeah, I think, you know, I do need to do a little bit more work on it in terms of benchmarking, make sure that it's optimal, but uh, yeah, it works. And that, that was the main thing. I really, really wanted to get this working. It's hopefully gonna give a very fast machine. I'm finding it, you know, super quick. Um, like, you know, if you open up Workbench, as you can see, it opens very quickly. So the only thing really that's outstanding now with this card is the memory. Uh, so yeah, we need to do something about that. So yeah, the memory. What are we gonna do about the memory? Well, if I show you here on the actual uh, Fastlane board, you'll see that the SIM slots, which are closest to the connector to the Zorro riser, they have aged uh, disproportionately compared to the other uh, SIM slots. And that's because they're the first ones that you have to put in. Uh, you have to put the chips in closest to the slot and then progress away from there. And over the years, you know, that's obviously happened a number of times, me included. And it just looks like the, especially the connector on the right, uh, furthest at the back has obviously aged a little bit too much and I don't think it really works very well anymore. Hopefully that's the extent of that. <laughs> There's a funny story about this actually. Uh, just today, I actually went on uh, a couple of forums asking about where I could source these sockets. You know, they're becoming quite rare. Um, I had actually reached out to a company in America a couple of days before and they were selling them for uh, $3 each, which is kind of the price you would expect to pay for a commodity like that back in the day. Unfortunately, they wouldn't sell to an individual. But then I did find a guy on eBay and he was selling, get this, 84 of them for all in because of the cost of delivery to the UK, about a 90 pounds, something like that. It still works out to be about one pound, 10 pence per slot. <laughs> so it's even cheaper. Um, but the problem is I have to buy 84 of them. But that's still much, much cheaper than buying them, for instance, from Analogic. Analogic actually have two of these left with metal clips. These ones that I bought are with metal clips and they were selling them for 32 pounds uh, for a, a dual pair, if that makes sense. So for the same thing, I would pay two pounds 20. Um, but these, the ones that I bought are actually individual. So when I receive those, it's probably gonna take a while. I need to take off the first four SIM slots to make it look at least symmetrical. Hopefully they will fit in. Um, I'm hoping they will. I'll probably start off with a light touch and just try and get those replaced. And um, if that fixes certain problems, then I'll probably go on and replace all the others just to make it look neat. But there was something I learned, which is that this card has a weakness in the sense of not sure if it uses the memory when it's operating, the SCSI side of it. But if there is any sort of problem with the memory, it can actually corrupt data going to the uh, SCSI card. And I found that on a couple of occasions when I was trying out the memory, uh, it would then cause the SCSI to not boot anymore. It actually corrupted the, the boot drive. Um, so if you do have one of these cards and you, and you need to make any changes to the memory, I would definitely recommend that you disconnect uh, any sort of uh, SCSI device from it. Uh, before you do that, because it can cause problems. 
Uh, what I would use in the future is this IDE device. You know, keep this. I probably might actually keep this with the machine for now because it's got the right uh, version of Workbench on there. I would boot up from here, then I would try and make test out the memory. And, uh, and if that happens, the data from here isn't actually going to go onto here and actually corrupt it because it's actually coming from here, right? It's going through the ID bus, not through the SCSI bus. Hope that makes sense. So yeah, so there's that. I also had a really weird situation as well, because right by here, I'll show you, there are a couple of headers and they're actually for uh, the um, LED. So you can see the, the drive activity. And I checked and I plugged in the LED jumper onto there. Uh, it's this cable here. And that also corrupted the drive, <laughs> which is very, very, very weird. So I need to do a little bit of research into that, why that happened. Uh, it's quite strange. And um, there is actually another LED jumper over here. So I need to test that, maybe get an oscilloscope and see what's happening. I should see activity, right, coming out of those. So maybe I just got them swapped around or something. I don't know, maybe. Uh, because the way this is meant to work over here is you can take the actual activity coming from this bus, the main bus, you can get it to go into this card. And then this card adds on its own activity. So you get the combination of the two. And then you can actually pipe out the uh, activity. Having said that, I did use the out as far as I can uh, see. And uh, yeah, like I said, I got corruption. So that was very strange. So for now, I've got the memory here. Uh, this is 16 megabytes uh, in here. I think I've got uh, 12 megabytes in one, one megabyte sticks. Uh, I do have another bag uh, with another um, 16 megabytes. So once all of this is uh, working, hopefully, um, I'd be happy, honestly, if I got the machine up to 32 megabytes. Even 16 megabytes was a, a really great amount of memory back in the day. I don't know why, but out there in the, in the community, there's a little bit of an obsession going on with getting computers like this to have basically what was, for the time, insane amounts of RAM, you know, 256 meg. Uh, it really wouldn't have been necessary unless you were using this maybe on something like uh, Lightwave to do some VFX. And you need all that memory to store all of that mesh data, texture data, et cetera. If this was like a top end, yeah, you know, video, uh, 3D, 3D video uh, workstation back in the day, I can understand that. But for now, pottering around, 16 megabytes is fine. 32 megabytes would be fantastic. So yeah, you know, any, anything's really a bonus. Because I bought this card, I would obviously like to get the memory working as well. But that's a bit of a, a back burner project for now. The SCSI is the most important part of it. And as we've seen, that is working great. Um, so yeah, um, the Fastlane card, I would love to see it cloned. That's something which would be really cool. I know that the A4091 was cloned, um, the Re Amiga version of it, which I think is a fantastic uh, thing to do because these are wonderful machines. People are making new uh, Amiga 4000s, Re Amiga 4000s. And I think that's great because I think they're a great machine. And if you've got a great machine like this and you really want to have the best uh, connectivity in it that you can get, and I really think that the fast lane is the top um, of the pile. It's as good as the A4091, except that it also has the ability to have all that extra memory as well. So yeah, it's really fantastic. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please uh, click on the like button. Uh, obviously that helps the video get promoted to other people. And if you did like this video and you're new to the channel especially, and you want to come back again, please click on the subscribe button uh, because we'd love to see you back again for you know, future videos. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this one and hopefully you'll enjoy future videos that we produce. So yeah, that's it for this video. Hope to see you again soon. And until then, have a nice day. Take care.